Uh, so welcome to CIDA seminar. It's my pleasure to introduce to you uh, Sarah Ellison. Uh, she got her PhD from the University of Cambridge in 2000. Uh, then she got a postdoc fellowship at ISO Chile. And three years after her PhD, uh, she got a Canada chair, uh, Canada research chair uh, fellowship where she went to the University of Victoria and became a professor in 2014. Uh, she has received uh, many res res uh, research honors and awards, and I will just like three of them. The Annie Jo Cannon Award for, from the American Astronomical Society, uh, Peter Martin Award from NASA, and the Richard Ford Medal in Physics from the Royal Astronomical Society in Canada. Uh, she has also served uh, prominent community roles, uh, like President of CASCA, or in 2015, she was uh, the Royal Society's Canada College of New Scholars. Um, and then, as a strong believer in work life balance, she's keen in doing sports. Uh, she's active in triathlon, in traveling, and has written a best selling guidebook in snorkeling around Vancouver Island. <laughs> And I just learned that she also manages to continue living without a cell phone, so I'm very happy for that. And now we can uh, let you uh, start a little talk on the gas and star formation in the nearby universe with the alma Mongra Quetching Star Formation Survey. Well, thank you very much, Nesh, for the, for the kind introduction. Uh, so, as always, it's lovely to be uh, back at CETA. This is my first visit back since the, since the pandemic, so uh, it's been nice to reconnect with old friends and meet some new people as well. Uh, so as uh, Nej said, I'm going to be talking to you today about this uh, survey that we call AlmaQuest, the Alma Manga Quenching and Star Formation Survey that I lead with uh, Li Hui Lin, who is based at Asia A in, uh, in Taipei. And so the goal of the AlmaQuest <coughs> survey, and therefore the topic of this talk, is all about understanding the processes that regulate star formation in nearby galaxies on relatively small scales, so subgalactic scales of around a kiloparsec. Um, we have a fairly large team. Um, I just want to highlight two of our junior scientists who have done a lot of the heavy lifting with the data analysis and, uh, uh, and, the, and the, the data processing. So Xi'an Pan, who is at Tampa University in Taiwan, and Mary Thorpe, who did a PhD with me at UVic and is now a postdoc. So before we dive into this particular galaxy survey, uh, I always think it's worth reminding ourselves that in these sort of this heady era of very, very large galaxy surveys where we're used to dealing with hundreds of thousands of millions of galaxies, it's really only been a century since we have changed our mindset from thinking that the Milky Way was the only galaxy in the universe to realizing that we live in a universe full of galaxies. And of course, uh, one of the people who is largely credited with opening our eyes to this universe of galaxies was Edwin Hubble. And so uh, you've all seen incarnations of this uh, Hubble tuning fork diagram uh, before, but this is actually a great place to start the motivation for the survey that we have been doing. So what Hubble's tuning fork told us was that galaxies organize themselves into two broad populations. So on the left-hand side of the tuning fork, we have the early type galaxies, so elliptical galaxies, spheroidal in shape, red in color because of their old solar populations and relatively poor in gas. And then on the right, we have the disc-dominated spiral galaxies, blue in color because of the young stellar populations, uh, rich in gas, and uh, sometimes with this uh, inner barred structure. So this idea of galaxy bimodality has really been around since the idea of the birth of, of galaxies themselves, but it's an idea that has been put onto very clear statistical footing thanks to the large generation of spectroscopic surveys that we've been enjoying for the last few decades. So uh, this is a, a, a plot taken from a paper by Kevin Chewinski based on uh, Sloan Digital Sky Survey data. And what you're looking at here is for the low redshift galaxy population, so after around the redshift of about 0.2 or 0.3, the distribution of uh, optical colors on the y-axis as a function of their stellar mass. 
So blue galaxies are at the bottom of the plot and red galaxies are at the top of the plot. So what you can see is that we have this bimodal distribution where galaxies like to populate either this so-called blue cloud or lie along this red sequence. So we have this kind of color vernacular because that's what we're plotting on the, on the y-axis. So the deficit of galaxies <coughs> that have intermediate colors is called the blue cloud. But this is really just a manifestation of Hubble's tuning fork because most of the galaxies down in the blue cloud are spirals and most of the galaxies up in the red sequence are ellipticals. Now, although stellar mass is a true physical parameter, the color is really just an observable. And so as surveys have gone along, as time has gone along, it's become, a more, it's become more common to replace this y-axis with another physical variable, which is the star formation rate. And so again, this kind of plot has been made by many people for many different surveys. This is again, the Sloan incarnation of it. Uh, so we still have stellar mass on the, on the x-axis and now the rate at which that galaxy is forming stars on the y-axis. Once again, you can see that the galaxies are organizing themselves into two broad populations. This time, the red galaxies though are on the bottom. They have low star formation rates for their stellar masses and then most of the disk galaxies are up here where they have relatively high star formation rates for their, uh, for their stellar masses. So when we plot it like this, we change the nomenclature from a color-based system to one that's referring to the star formation properties. And so this ridge line uh, here that I've, I've hand-painted on in cyan, which is the trend of star formation rate for these actively forming galaxies as a function of stellar mass. We call this the star forming main sequence. Uh, then the galaxies that are down here, these are variously called the quenched galaxies or passive galaxies or quiescent galaxies. And we use all of those terms interchangeably, essentially just means not much star formation given their stellar mass. So you can imagine taking a vertical slice through this diagram and you'd end up with this kind of bimodal distribution. Um, and so by definition, uh, we're going to have this cyan line mark our zero point from which we're going to measure star formation rate offsets. So I'm going to refer to this as a delta SFR. Sometimes in the literature you see it as delta main sequence, it's exactly the same thing. Um, so by definition, it marks the peak of the star forming main sequence, the green valley in between, uh, and then the quench population here. Now, because we measure star formation rate on a log scale in this, uh, in this plot, what that means is that the delta SFR of, say, minus one means that galaxy is forming its stars at a rate 10 times less than we would expect for its stellar masses. So this is going to be an important metric for us when we're wanting to quantify how much extra star formation or how much less star formation a given galaxy has for its stellar mass. So keep that in mind. Uh, why is it a straight line? Uh, why is this yes. a straight line? Well, it's not always a straight line. Sometimes that's a turnover. Different people will approach this in different ways. In this particular way, just for simplicity, you might plot it as a straight line. But it does actually have a, a flat thing. If you, if you don't plot the contours, you can actually see it. It's just a way of grammar. Uh, so a big question uh, that has been keeping the extragalactic community busy for a number of years is what causes galaxies to move between these two sequences. So a naive explanation could be, well, you know, a galaxy starts off with lots of gas, builds up its stellar population and exhausts that gas, and so eventually it has to run out of fuel, and so it's just going to passively decline onto that quench sequence. But we have many reasons to believe that it's probably not that simple. Um, one reason is that simulations indicate that it is certainly more complex than that uh, when you look at the way that they are evolving. So this is a plot from a paper by Matt Orr from a few years ago from these high resolution fire simulations that you probably know about from speaking with Norm. Um, but so just very briefly, these are sort of all singing, all dancing, fancy ISM models uh, done at very high resolution. So there are four galaxies in this, uh, in this plot. 
black line, the cyan line, the blue line, and the red line. And so each of these lines is showing how the star formation rate of an individual galaxy is changing as a function of time as it's building up its stellar mass. And then for reference, these smooth green and blue lines are showing the observational mate sequence of two different regions. The key point to take away from this plot is that uh, the simulated galaxies do not have a smooth evolution. They are stochastically moving up and down, onto, below, and sometimes even above in a starburst phase around the, the main sequence. So then we need to ask ourselves, right, so what are the processes that are doing this regulation? So let's first of all think about processes that might quench or shut down star formation imbalances. So, so here are a few possibilities, not an exhaustive list. Uh, the first one, as I've already alluded to, is simply that the galaxy uses up its gas. So no more fuel, no more star formation. Uh, alternatively, rather than just passively using up the gas, if the gas is forcibly removed from the galaxy. So for example, if you're in a cluster and the galaxy is experiencing something like ground pressure stripping. Or if the gas is removed through an internal mechanism, such as through AGN, so if you have powerful outflows that are being driven by this central engine. An alternative uh, possibility could be that you still have gas in the galaxy, but it is in a state that is not conducive to forming stars. So a very popular model that's been around for a number of years is so-called morphological quenching, where the presence of a large bulge component actually acts to stabilize uh, the gas in the disk against gravitational collapse. That's an yeah. So on the lower right, I, 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 kind of like, no, I, I kind of like the AGN idea, but you can kind of double the picture too that it gets rid of a lot of gas in the middle, but all the stuff on the outside could still form stars, perhaps. So it's not exhausting all of the gas that's capable of keeping things going. So, uh, we hold that thought because <laughs> we're going to come back to it. But um, I, I think this has, been, this has been a matter of debate, certainly within the simulations, because older generations of simulations that had very aggressive feedback models found it very easy to completely remove the gas. And indeed, that's not really what we see in the observations. But I'm going to come back to this very quickly at this point. OK, so now let's think about the mechanisms that might increase the star formation, either putting the galaxy back onto the main sequence or even moving it above into the star that's being created. So a very, very popular mechanism for achieving a star <laughs> is a major merger. So when you have two approximately equal mass galaxies that have a gravitational interaction, funnels gas towards the center, uh, that buildup of uh, a high surface density gas in the middle, you get a starburst. But you can also get that same effect if you have a minor merger. So if you have just a small companion, this can be enough to disturb the ISM and produce a starburst as well. Uh, both the major and the minor merger, mergers rely on non axisymmetric structures to drain the angular momentum. And you can get that in a secular way as well. So for example, galaxy bars, uh, we have good reason to believe that these are also, uh, even secular bars are effective at moving the, the gas around. Other internal structures, uh, if you get these very clumpy disks, then this is another way that the, the clumps, they talk off of one another and again, send the gas towards the center and you can get a central starburst. Another um, scenario that gained a lot of traction a few years ago was the idea of gas flowing in along the filamentary structure of the, of the cosmic web. And so this feeding, if it can get all the way down onto the disk, can also produce uh, starbursts. And then just as AGN have been implicated as possible quenching mechanisms, They've also been suggested as possible mechanisms for increasing the star formation rate. So if you have, uh, if you have winds, then the material that gets piled up 
in the uh, in the edges of these outflows, you're also increasing the surface density of the gas there, so maybe you can trigger the stopwatch. So there is a smorgasbord of possibilities here. How are we going to start to disentangle which of these might actually be at play and which might be might be dominant? So our friend in all of this is being able to spatially resolve where the star formation is happening. Because you can imagine you can get a very different signature if you have a merger versus a nice bar versus you know clumpy disc and, and outflow. It's all structurally different. And so being able to use large surveys of spatially resolved um, spectra mm -hmm. has really been where we've been able to, to make some, some progress here. So there are a number of surveys around. I'm going to be focusing on Manga, which is part of the, the slow generation. So Manga is now complete. Uh, it observed on the order of around 10,000 galaxies in the nearby universe, so typically around the redshift of 0.1. And uh, this was really a brilliant idea, I think, when it came about. Now it sort of seems obvious, but uh, I feel like there must have been a eureka moment at some point where the folks at Sloan said, OK, we have these individual fibers that we're putting one on one galaxy, but we can bundle them together into these integral field units, so these fiber bundles, and then you, know, you can put that whole bundle on a galaxy. So rather than just getting a single spectrum at the center of the galaxy, now you have spectrum <coughs> all over the face of the Manga uh, is now public, and so there are some 19 million individual spectra, so spaxel, so uh, spatial spectral pixels that are available for public consumption. And so from these individual spectra in the in individual spaxels, you can make maps of either directly measured quantities such as mission line fluxes across the face of the galaxy. And then, of course, you can fit the spectra with your favorite set of models to derive things like stellar masses, gas-based metallicities, ages, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a real treasure chest of, uh, of information. So how are we going to take this information and use it to tell us where the star formation is, is happening? There's a huge amount of information here. So to give you an example of how we can do this, uh, this is a figure from a paper that I published in 2018 using one of the earlier data releases from, from Manga. And you should think of this as analogous to the global star forming main sequence that I've already shown you. Okay? So the passive galaxies aren't on, on here. This is just the star forming main sequence. So total stellar mass of a galaxy, total star formation rate of the galaxy, and this offset that I've told you that we can, that we can measure. We do the same for individual spaxels. So each spaxel is approximately a kiloparsec region in a galaxy. So in that spaxel, we can measure the surface density of the stellar mass and the surface density of the star formation rate. Uh, so this is just a density histogram of, uh, of, of all of those spaxels. And you can see that just as there is a relationship for the global quantity, so there is for the, uh, for the individual spaxels. So this was discovered long before uh, Manga, um, but uh, I'm just showing you the, the Manga view here. And so this has been termed the resolved star forming main sequence. Like I do the air quotes because we're of course not resolving individual GNCs here, uh, individual regions of star formation. <coughs> when you hear resolved, it just means on a subgalactic scale. This is what we're doing in the LBM. <laughs> <laughs> Much more resolved. <laughs> Um, and so, just as we have this delta SFR here, we do the same for spaxel. We can say at a given surface density of stellar mass, is my spaxel more or less star forming? So, there's a bit of a Greek letter mouthful with delta sigma SFR that allows us to say for this individual region in the galaxy, is it more or less star forming? Okay. Is this the indicator for the spectral degree? So, we're using H alpha. H -alpha. Yeah. So then what you can do is you can split the galaxy population up. Uh, and in this figure, what we've done is we have made our slices based on the total star formation rate in the, in the galaxy. So for example, we can take all of the galaxies that are in this so-called starburst regime with a high positive delta SFR. So we can take all the galaxies that are 
in that starburst regime, we take all of their spaxels and compute these delta sigma SFRs, and that's the purple line here. Right? It's the ensemble average. Um, so delta sigma SFR of zero means that spaxel has a normal star formation rate for its stellar mass. So what we're seeing in the starburst galaxies is that even out to, this goes out to one and a half effective radii, the star formation rate is enhanced everywhere, but the boost is the highest in the central regions. And then we can step through ensembles of galaxies going down through the main sequence. We can come out the other end and pick out the galaxies that are quenched, so they have a low, uh, they a negative delta SFR. We can draw their average profile here in red. And so now we see this nice kind of symmetry. So just as there was an enhancement everywhere in the starburst galaxies, we see that quenched galaxies are suppressed everywhere, uh, but the signal is based in the center. And so from this manga study, we concluded that the regulation of the star formation um, was happening preferentially in the center. So the star formation was both boosted and suppressed from the inside of that. Now, this is all well and good, but if you really want to know something about star formation, you need to measure the gas, right? Because it's the gas that is, that is making the stars in the, in the third place. And so this was the motivation for this ALMAQUEST survey, the ALMA Manga Quenching and Star Formation Survey, where we selected galaxies from Manga, and then we obtained ALMA observations in CO with matched spatial resolution. So we started off with 46 <coughs> galaxies. That was the original survey that was published uh, in 2020. We recently added uh, 20 more galaxies that we call the extended Almacrest survey, and that paper is uh, submitted at the moment. So uh, we have these 66 galaxies where we're mapping then the CO on exactly the same spatial scale. So for each spaxel where we have manga information, we have the molecular gas measurement in that same in that same. Now, one of the really important features of our galaxy selection is its diversity. So we have some galaxies that are on the star forming main sequence, we have some that are quenching, and we have some that are starburst. So this diversity means that we can study the various processes that are both boosting and quenching the, the star formation. And for good measure, we also have a fair number of uh, mergers in there as well. As that seems to be a, a key um, phase that, that the galaxies go through. So I'm going to focus this talk on the measurement of three parameters. Two of them I've already introduced you to, the surface density of the star formation rate and the surface density of the stellar mass. And then with the ALMA observations, we can also measure the surface density of the molecular gas. So you can combine those three surface densities together pairwise in three different ways. And that's going to give you three scaling relations. So the first one I've already introduced you to, the star forming main sequence. So you don't need ALMA for this, this is just manga data, um, but I'm showing you the ALMA quest view of this, uh, of this scaling relation. So you can see, you know, we recover this scaling relation between the star formation rate and the, uh, and the star mass. So we have about 20,000 individual regions across these 60 galaxies, 66 galaxies that we can make special in. So we have very nice statistics. Then you can look at how the star formation rate scales with the molecular gas. So this is the famous uh, schmidt kennicutt relation. And because we're doing this on spaxel kiloparsec scales, we call it the resolved schmidt so again, this is not new, it's been studied for decades. <coughs> this is just the AlmaQuest view of it. And then the third way that you can combine these quantities uh, hasn't really been looked at very much in the past. So how the gas traces the stellar mass. So because this hadn't really appeared in the literature before, we had to make up a name for it. So we call this the resolved molecular gas main sequence. So again, you can see a nice tight correlation between so given that all three of these quantities scale with one another, it shouldn't come as any surprise to see that you can render them in a three-dimensional way. So the individual black points here are the individual spaxels, 
Um, and then you can, of course, project those onto the two-dimensional planes that give you those three different scaling equations. And so what you can see is that you have this sort of cigar sausage-shaped cylinder within this three-dimensional space that they're, they're all correlating with one another. And this was actually the very first AlbaQuest paper that we, started, that we published back in 2019. Um, and in it, we argued that the molecular gas main sequence, so the stellar mass and the gas, plus the schmidt kennicut relation are, if you will, the fundamental ones that set up this three-dimensional space, and that the star-forming main sequence is just a, a rendering of that structure, but it's not a physically motivated one. So the stellar mass is not driving the star formation rate. It's the other two that are the fundamental ones. I'm happy to answer more questions about that, um, but this is not going to be the focus of my talk, so I've got much more recent results that I, that I want to show you. Um, okay, so this has been looking at the ensemble of all of the factors and all of these gas. Now we're going to unpack this into looking at what the individual galaxies are doing. So this is a selection of, I think there are 32 in this, uh, in this montage, individual galaxies in our sample. Uh, this is the resolve star forming main sequence, and in each panel the grayscale is the ensemble of all the spectrals just there for a visual reference. And then the blue points in each panel are showing you uh, the points in an individual galaxy. And the point to take away from this is that there is a resolved star forming main sequence in every individual galaxy, but it is different in every galaxy. So in some galaxies it's below the average, in some galaxies it's above the average, in some galaxies it's above the average. So whilst the presence of the relation is universal, the form of it is certainly not. And we see the same thing when we look at the schmidt kennicut relation, as is the same ensemble of galaxies. And so again, you can see just casting your eye across these panels, the relation is there, but it is different from one galaxy to another. And then the same in the molecular gas main sequence. So even the relationships that we believe should be somewhat fundamental, like converting the gas into stars, which is the schmidt kennicut relation, it's not the same in, in, in every galaxy. Um, so now the sort of the newer part of the work that I want to show you is that there is a new scaling relationship on the rock. Um, and actually you had a talk uh, about this uh, just a couple of uh, weeks ago by uh, Sultan Hassan who was, uh, who was visiting. So I'm just going to sort of very briefly uh, summarize this, uh, this relationship that is based on a theory of star formation called the pressure regulated feedback modulated theory of star formation, or the PRFM model. So the very sort of simple qualitative idea of this model is that if you take the midplane of a, a galactic disk, if that disk is in equilibrium, the pressure that is felt in the disk, that is the combination of the pressure that comes from the dark matter component, the stellar component, and then also the gas self-gravity, that so that has to be balanced by something. And in this model, it is balanced by feedback that comes from the stars in the disk. And so in that case, we expect a relationship between how much star formation you have, because that's Using the outward force and the, and the pressure that you have in the, in the disk. So this has been predicted both analytically and from, from simulations. Um, the idea goes back a decade or two, but in its latest incarnation uh, has been uh, work that Eve Ostreich and Chang Yu Kim have been, have been championing. So it's a figure from their 2022 20, paper, which is a simulation-based paper, so this set of simulations called the Tigris simulations. And so their black line here is the prediction that they make between uh, the pressure, the dynamical equilibrium pressure, and the star formation. And then the colored points that you can see are observational surveys, IFQ surveys, uh, in which these quantities are measured and what's pretty good. However, uh, these surveys, so FANGS, for example, Edge Khalifa, these surveys have really only included 
well-behaved, normal star-forming galaxies. They don't have the quenched galaxies in there, they don't have the mergers in there, they don't have the starbursts in there. And so AlmaQuest gives us the opportunity to push this model a bit harder and see how it performs. So here is the resolved dynamical equilibrium pressure relation for AlmaQuest. Uh, so the red dot dashed line is the thing to be comparing our green data to. So at first blush, think, well, that's not bad, right? I mean, the, the line goes through where most of the, the data lie. But if you scrutinize this a bit harder, you can see that in contrast to this approximately linear prediction, the data have kind of a, a, a bend in them, right? That is not predicted in the, in the simulations. And it turns out that you can understand this bend if you split the data, the, the galaxy sample up, into those that are normal star-forming galaxies on the main sequence versus those that are starbursting. So this is still the AlmaQuest data, but I have split the sample into those galaxies that are within a 0.3 deck of the global star-forming main sequence and those that are at least a factor of two above the main sequence. So when we have the normal star-forming galaxies, we can see they, they're in really good agreement with this PRFM model, um, as previous data sets have found as well. But it's in our starbursting sample that you can see things are going wrong. We have this much flatter relationship. And so it's the combination of this plus this that gave us that break in the, in the full ensemble. So whilst there is a clear relationship between the dynamical equilibrium pressure and the star formation rate. So there is a strong dynamical equilibrium pressure relation. It is not one that is well reproduced by this PRFM model. On the other hand, there is a different model of star formation. Um, there are many different models of star formation. Uh, but this one published by Mark Kohholz in 2018, he says, okay, well, Maybe there's an additional contribution to the feedback that's not just the stellar feedback that comes from, it's a dynamical component. And so in his model in particular, it's generated by radial motions of, of gas. And we expect that in many of these starbursts, these are, many of these are mergers. And so we do expect there to be some, some radial gas motions. So these solid, these three solid lines here that are in various shades of orange, our predictions from the Krumholtz model. There is a free parameter in that model, which is the orbital time, uh, which is why I've shown three possible curves. So obviously you have many different choices of this orbital time. Uh, but you can see that the general feature is that it does have this curvature to it and this flattening um, at, higher, uh, at higher pressures, which is where the Ostriker and Kim model starts to, to deviate. From, uh, from the AlphaQuest data. I've also plotted on here actually measurements from other surveys, so FANGS and Edge Khalifa. And actually, when you look at these individual data points, even though they don't sample this high pressure regime very well, you can actually see that even they were failing with the Australian Premium model. Um, I, I, I think they probably weren't bold enough to make the statement because that's not where most of the data were, but with the AlmaQuest sample, you can, you can really see that deviation. So I think this has been quite a nice test. To distinguish some of these, uh, these different models. But then we can come back to the question of which of these scaling relations is fundamental, like which of these is actually telling us about some true physical process as opposed to having a bunch of intercorrelated variables. And so this again has been something that the community has been working on for a number of years and commonly the way that it's been done uh, is very simplistic, and it's just to say, okay, we're going to look at the scatter in these scaling relations, and the one that's fundamental should be the one with the smallest scatter. Uh, and so what we're looking at here is the scatter around these four relations, so the Schmidt-Kenny cup, the like Gaffman sequence, star forming sequence, and the dynamical pressure equilibrium. Um, and for each of those relations, I've split my sample into these four different subsamples. So, for example, this is the Schmidt Hennecke relation the scatter um, for the galaxies that are in mergers. 
the galaxies that have central starbursts, the ones that are normal, based on no funny business, uh, and then the full sample. And so what you can see is that the scatter that you measure depends on the sample that you have. Since I've shown you that there is a lot of variation from one galaxy to, a gal from one galaxy to another, that shouldn't be too surprising. Um, however, the problem with this, in addition to the sample selection issue, is that what if these relations are not actually linear? I mean, they look pretty linear, most of them, but we've seen certainly for the pressure relation, it's not true, it's got this great. So uh, to do this in a more sophisticated way, we turn to machine learning techniques, and in particular, using a random forest. So this is a figure taken from an AlmaQuest paper led by William Baker last year. And what William did in his paper was he trained a random forest to so basically ask the random forest, if I give you a whole bunch of variables, which one is the best at predicting my target, which is the star formation rate? So what is the, it's trying to unpack what is the fundamental driver of star formation rate. Uh, so this was before we started working on the, on the pressure work, so the pressure's not in this, uh, in this plot. But you can see you put in a whole bunch of different variables, you know, how much stellar mass there is in total, what the surface density is, what the radius is, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And this bar chart tells you the relative importance of each of these input <coughs> variables in predicting the target. And so what you see is that it's the surface density of the molecular gas that is easily the winner in this competition. So this is essentially telling you the schmidt kennecott relation. Is the, is the winner. Um, so this is a very powerful technique because it doesn't require any fitting, it can tease out nonlinear relationships. Uh, but now we can also put in here the dynamical equilibrium pressure. And now the picture really changes because when you put in the dynamical equilibrium pressure, suddenly the relative importance of the molecular gas shrinks right down because you've given it something that it thinks is much more important. So it's, it's important to recognize this is a relative importance. This isn't an absolute number. It just means of the variables you give it, which does it think is, uh, is most important. Now, the pundits amongst you are going to say, okay, but wait, sorry, you're already cheating here because you've told us that this pressure combines the stellar mass and the gas. So you've kind of, you've, you've, you've cheated. You've given it all the information. So of course it's going to do better. So what we did to test whether this pressure is fundamentally capturing something truly physical is we tried giving the random forest other recipes of combining the gas and the star. So for example, this combination here, this represents something that folks call the extended Kennecott-Schmidt relation. Um, this combination here combines with the same um, indices the, the same sort of power laws that you have in the equation that goes into this, but it drops some of the other variables. So it doesn't have the velocity dispersion in there, it doesn't have the H1 in there, et cetera, et cetera. So you can try all of these different combinations and none of them do very well. It's only when you combine these two things in the right way, i.e. with the pressure, that you actually start getting this, this predictive power. Now, this is not to say that this is the best, it's the best of the ones that we so this dynamical equilibrium pressure seems to be more fundamental than the schmidt kennecott relation, but maybe we still haven't found our way to that all the way down. Okay, so for my last sort of 10 minutes or so, I'm gonna switch gears. We're gonna stay in the AlmaQuest survey, but whereas up until now, I've been talking about um, star forming spaxels and what's regulating the, the star formation around the main sequence, now I'm going to start thinking about the quenching piece of this. So um, in addition to taking the spaxels, so the regions that are actively star forming, we also have a recipe for identifying the regions that seem to be in the process of quenching. Um, I'm happy to answer questions about how we do that, but for now I'm just going to tell you that we can identify these regions that we call retired. So this Retired uh, nomenclature is meant to indicate that the, the spaxel has been forming stars um, in the not too distant past, but now it's on its way to, to quenching. So we're interested in these regions because it's telling us about this transition period. 
So here's the molecular gas main sequence again. Uh, the blue shading is showing you that sequence for my star forming spaxels, so the ones that you've already seen. But now the orange contours are showing you the distribution for those so called retired regions. And what you can see are two things. First, there is still a sequence, <coughs> but second, it is offset from what we see for the star forming regions in the sense that at a fixed amount of stellar mass, there is less gas. And another way of saying that is the gas fraction is lower. So the gas fraction is just this divided by this, as I'm plotting that in the inset here. So you can see the gas fractions of the retired regions are lower by factors of several, <clears throat> up to a factor of 10 or so, compared to the star point of regions. So this is telling us that the depletion of gas is linked to the retirement of, uh, of star formation. So now we can, yes. I have a question. Are retired spaxels out of gas or just not in the right phase? In other words, are they exhausted or no, are... they're not lacking gas. So that's why I was going to point out here. So. This again is the molecular gas mean sequence for eight individual galaxies. And again, the grayscale is for all the star forming spaxels, there is a reference. The blue are the star forming spaxels in a given, in each galaxy, and the orange are the retired spaxels in this galaxy. So you can see that there are, these retired spaxels have detectable molecular gas, but there is less of it. Um, we don't have measurements of the H1, so this is really just one phase that we're measuring. So this is why I've said in the text up here, there's a decline in the molecular gas, but not an absence. But there could also be that the molecular gas has been dissociated, and, and, and that we're not tracing with these observations. And then you can look at the gas fractions of these individual galaxies, again, just to sort of have a home the point that the retired spaxels have got lower gas fractions than the star forming spaxels in the same galaxy. Okay, so what is actually causing this, this quenching? So we can get a hint of this if again we leverage the spatial information that we get both from, from Alma and from Manga. So here are four galaxies. The magenta hexagon shows you the footprint of the manga IFU, so that's where we have manga data. And then in the lower panels for each one, I've color-coded the spaxels blue if they're actively star forming, and orange if they're classified as retired. If you see gray, <coughs> it means they are other, they can be, uh, you know, they can have EGN in the center, or they can have low signal to noise, but we're just gonna look at the orange and the blue. So what you can see is, is I think, you know, great surprise because we know that bulges are old and gas poor, uh, that it is in the central regions that we're preferentially seeing this quenching and that ties back to my very first manga result that I showed you where we have this inside out quenching. So inside out quenching has really got a firm foothold in the community now, uh, but we still don't really know what's causing it. A favorite mechanism is AGN because that is a process that is rooted in the center of the galaxy. So if you're seeing an impact in the center, AGN are maybe a natural candidate. But there is a problem with this. If you want the AGN to be shutting down your star formation, for example, through the removal of gas, you'd better be seeing that the AGN have different gas properties than a normal star. People have looked over and over and over again in the observations to measure the total gas content of AGN compared to the <coughs> control sample, and they never find any difference. Um, there's a whole literature on this. I'm just showing you two examples, one with the atomic gas and one with the molecular gas. Uh, so this is a paper of mine from a few years ago where we measured the H1 content, content through 21 centimeter emission. Uh, so this is for so Sloan selected AGN, so in optical emission lines, BPT diagram, CFIT galaxies, etc. 
cetera, we compare the H1 gas fraction of our AGM with the control sample, and with the possible exception of the lowest masses, um, we basically see the same gas fraction. Same thing in the molecular gas, so uh, this is work by Mike Koss. So uh, he's taking um, H2 as inferred by CO for a sample of X-ray selected AGM from BAT and comparing it to a control sample of Sloan selected galaxies. And again, you see these two are instinctual. And this is even true when you look at the most luminous nearby quasars. Um, even at high luminosities, the gas fractions seem unaffected. Okay, so is that is that it? Nail in the coffin for AGM? Well, maybe not. As Peter very uh, tenaciously asked, maybe it's not a global impact. Maybe it's just happening on limited spatial scales. So we wanted to tackle this with AlmaQuest, but unfortunately, uh, we don't have uh, any really notable CIFO galaxies in our sample. Uh, so instead, we turn to a different sample that is very similar in its properties, um, selected in a different way, but similar in the sense that it has IFU data from Khalifa uh, and CO maps from the, uh, from the edge survey, which come in karma rather than, uh, rather than Alma. So this is a larger sample, 126 galaxies, and there are four strong AGM in, uh, in this sample. So now we can do the same trick again. We can look at the molecular gas main sequence. All the data on here are now from Edge Khalifa, not from AlmaQuest. But Edge Khalifa still has a nice molecular gas main sequence showing show here in blue for the star forming spaxels. It also has a sequence for its retired spaxels that is offset to low gas fractions. So that's nice, all consistent with what we're finding. And then the red points here, these are individual spaxel measurements for central AGM regions. And so you can see that they follow um, quite closely what you see in the retired regions. Um, maybe not surprising because they're central regions in that they have these, these low gas fractions. Um, so here are the individual galaxies. So you can see uh, this is the one with the biggest offset. But in all cases, uh, the extrapolation of the molecular gas mean sequence that you see in, um, in the star forming regions it's distinct in the uh, in the AGM regions. There's a, there's a, there's a difference. This has also been seen on much higher spatial resolution scales recently with the with the GATOS survey, where they're really looking inside the inner few ten parsecs or so. We're not really resolving the, the same <coughs> influence here, um, but it seems that if the AGM is having an effect, it's only having an effect on these very limited spatial scales. Uh, and then again, here are the, uh, the individual gas fractions. So uh, in these AGN regions, the gas fraction being reduced by typically a factor of a few, maybe up to uh, an order of magnitude. Uh, the AlmaQuest survey has been very productive. I've just given you a real um, little taster. Here I've put the list of the first 10 of our, uh, of our papers in case there is anything here. That you're particularly interested in, whether you care about rotation curves, for example, or you care, care about galaxy mergers. Uh, I think we're now up to paper 13 or 14 or so, but I, I ran out of space on the slide. But uh, there's, there's lots out there if you are uh, interested. Um, so I'll just very briefly summarize. So I've shared with you the results of our Mango <coughs> Quenching and Star Formation survey where we've combined Ranger IFQ data with similar spatial scales measured in CO. Um, one of our first results was uh, demonstrating that these three surface density variables are all intercorrelated. They, they form this organized three-dimensional structure um, and that the star forming main sequence that we've known and loved for so many years is probably not fundamental. It's just there. Uh, as, a, as a byproduct of other more fundamental relations. And then I introduced this uh, dynamical equilibrium pressure scaling relation, which is a very tight relation in, uh, in, in our data and is the relation that has the best scaling with star formation. <coughs> I also showed you that it is not 
well reproduced by this uh, PRM model of star formation, but is in fact more consistent with, I think, probably a more realistic model, which also includes um, turbulence from, uh, from, from dynamical motions. And then we also looked at the retired regions to try to address what's going on in quenching, and we see that at least part of the reason that the quenching is happening is, uh, uh, is a lack of gas. And then if there is any feedback onto the gas in the, uh, the AGN population, it's unlikely to be galaxy-wide and probably limited to, at most, a central kilopass energy. And with that, thank you very much, and have you taken questions. Taking on the, the Zoom chat, so if there are any questions, you can also raise your hand. Uh, I see. I saw you first. Uh, do I need something to speak into, or can you speak? You can you can speak loudly. I'll, and I'll, I'll, I'll repeat. Well, I've been known to speak loudly. Um, great talk. It's totally perfect for what we're That's trying nice. to do with CO map, although the redshifts are entirely different. Um, what I wanted to address is the issue of what one might call retired AGNs. That is to say, what does it mean? Uh, an AGN is going to do its thing, and then it may go dormant. How do you actually uh, label entities that would have that dormancy period? Because the time scale for its impact is going up on the gas, and gas uh, uh, that you know you looking at this thing that seems not to work. It could be that maybe it still works, it's just that there is a different time scale for when the AGM does its last thing and when it then retires for a while and then it comes back and forth, you know. So in other words, the labeling AGM may actually not be particularly appropriate because of that effect of the time difference. So let me just summarize that <coughs> on Zoom in case they can hear it. So Dick's question was... Um, they, they can hear. Oh, they can hear. Yeah. Right. Can I, can I try, <laughs> well, I won't try to repeat. Um, so you're absolutely right. This is, this is a challenge, I think, for many aspects of studying AGN is that on-off duty cycle. So I think the fact that we see an impact on the central gas reservoirs for the AGN tell us that for this brief moment when the AGN is on, the response must be quick. So I think this tells us that it's unlikely to be a dynamical impact that is moving the gas, because the time scale that you need, the time scale that you need to move the gas a few kilopons is actually quite long, given the speeds of these most these outflows that we expect. So I think that the deficit of gas that we're seeing is more likely to be in response to a more prompt uh, effect, like just dissociating the, the molecule. So then the question, as you say, becomes, can the galaxy recover from that? And I think the answer is probably yes. Right? If you've only affected the inner region, you're either going to resupply it with new gas, or if there's still dust there, the molecules can, can, can reform. So, then looking at the big picture and asking, are the AGN actually doing the whole scale quenching? In this mode, it seems unlikely, right? But it's not that the AGN is, in this old style picture, wholesale removing all the gas. The hints that we get from cosmological simulations find that the best link to what the AGN is doing in terms of whether the galaxy is quenched or not is the mass of the black hole. And so the interpretation, and this isn't, this isn't my work, but the interpretation that people have attached to that is that rather than it being a prompt feedback where you accrete and you blow out, that with each small accretion event that you have, you're steadily heating the halo such that on long time scales, you now have inhibited the, the reservoir that's going to ultimately replenish things. So that was sort of maybe a longer answer to your question, but, uh, but yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Well, can I just do a, a quick follow-up? I think that what you're also saying, though, is that the pressure associated with AGN is perhaps not that important, not in terms of the, what I am interpreting is that the attractor here is the uh, hydrostatic equilibrium attempt, and that that's why the pressure uh, model works so well. Uh, in the, for, the, for the star forming disk, yes. You know, whether the AGN pressure is important, I mean, I think, so we know that AGN generate outflows, right? So there is clearly an impact. Um, where it seems to not be important is removing all the gas from the gas. It's, it's, it's not strong enough to do that. Yeah, pumping is the uh, pressure pumping associated with the AGN. It doesn't actually happen generate huge wind. That's why these did the discs are still intact and still follow the overall line. Yeah, exactly. I have like two questions that are somehow related. Uh, one about your active galaxies, you showed uh, um, how the parameters were influencing the star coming rate in that. Um, uh, gas uh, density was one of the main ones, and then the velocity was not too far behind. I was wondering um, if the velocity was kind of factored in the pressure terms, because velocity kind of helps to cool the gas. And so, is it? Uh, it's the... not explicitly in the equation for for, for the pressure, um, but I think it ends up being in there implicitly because yeah. the, the sigma H2 yeah, yeah. is itself connected. <laughs> yeah, and maybe just to follow up on that one, the, uh, the galaxies that uh, you have shown that spec cell by spec cell are kind of departing from the relation. Um, was there a link between middle city and those departure from, from the relation? Do you have time to look at it? That we haven't looked at. Okay. Um, and on for the uh, the more passive galaxies. I was wondering if you had uh, had the chance to compare Stockerman uh, rate that, that were um, calculated using indicator that are less sensitive to very massive stars. Just because you know, like the IMF truncation and IMF variation at high metallicity in the center might affect this. Like I was wondering so which would be your which would be your example. which would be your favorite. I don't know. Yeah, I want to kind of hear your thoughts on that. So the only other one that we've looked at is the default value. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. But we have not. We have not yeah. Okay. Yeah. And nothing was there. Okay. Thanks. Okay. There's one more question online from Jai. Uh, what CO2 H2 conversion factor was used for the molecular gas measurements, especially for the starburst systems? Is it possible that the flattening of the star formation rate pressure relation at the high end is partly due to conversion factor variations? It's never a star formation talk if you don't have a good debate about conversion factor. Okay, so just <laughs> for those of you who might not know what this question is about, you might have noticed some sleight of hand on this slide where I say, okay, what we measure is one to zero, but suddenly H2 is the subscript in all these quantities, and that's because um, we can't easily measure molecular hydrogen. Uh, CO is the next most abundant molecule, so we measure CO and then we try to infer through this so called conversion factor. So the default that we have used for all of our data is a single galactic value. Uh, there is a very long discussion in this submission paper uh, about then trying different formalisms. So one that's metallicity dependent, one that's star formation rate radius dependent. Um, it of course changes the numbers a bit. In a, a given spat, so we'll now have a different number, but it does not ever fix this bend uh, and bring it into agreement with this with this predicted model. So. Whilst I would fully recognize that our measurements are imperfect, even with that imperfection in there, PDE is still the best correlator. So that 
that conclusion, I think, is robust. Um, whether or not it could um, fix this with the, uh, the osteochrome the model, we haven't found a recipe. The second question. No, I just uh, said thank you. That's very convincing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I hope the referee will find it convincing too. <laughs> it's like two pages worth of the uh, text. Any more questions? I'm just going to ask a simple question. In three dimensional projection, you said there's two which are more fundamental than the third. I understand the SK being fundamental, but why is the other one? Why would molecular gas carding with stellar mass? It doesn't seem there's any reason for that. Yeah, so that's actually linked to the sort of older idea of this pressure regulation in that if the stellar mass is a good representation of the overall potential, which should be set by the stellar mass and the dark matter, which we really can't measure, uh, can't make these um, <coughs> And then if the gas is settling, onto that potential, then you would end up with this, this relationship. So the way I think of it is that the, the, the existing stellar mass, the potential is there, is telling the next generation of gas where it should be. And then that gas is forming the star, so that's why you have, then have the schmidt henneke correlation on top of the molecular gas. Nice sequence. Yes. But I, because I agree, it's, it's maybe it's not intuitive. You had a, a follow up slide to this. Uh, you, so, the, you have to change galaxies to change whether there's a bend or not, or is it position in the galaxy that. Uh, yeah, that's another good question. I don't think I have the slide there because I have the individual pressure relations as well. Uh, for the most part, you don't see the bend in an individual galaxy. Occasionally, you do. Um, and that tends to be when it's a merger and you're in the very central region and you see this, you see this one. So you, can, so you can see it within individual galaxies, but most galaxies, it's relatively different. So you haven't actually defined how you calculate the pressure. Yes, so it is uh, a combination of, so you've got two main terms. One term is the gas self-gravity, so that's really just coming from our sigma H2 plus an assumption of the H1, which we don't have. Sure. Uh, and then the stellar gravity term, uh, so we have the sigma star and there's a velocity dispersion term in there, in that, the velocity dispersion in that second term. So, but you don't use the velocity dispersion of a gas at all? Uh, we, so if we had a good measure of it, we would use it. So the FANGS folks do it that way. Um, we don't have the resolution to do it, so we actually assume a velocity dispersion. Okay, so I mean there's a, there's two different pressures, so to speak. Right. There's the hydrostatic pressure from the weight of all the material. And that's going to be sigma gas squared plus sigma gas times sigma star, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. And then there's a dynamical pressure, which is basically rho v squared. Yes. Because the Mach number of these flows is high, so you don't need to worry about the thermal pressure, which means the metallicity doesn't matter. But the metallicity still comes into the formation of that invoice point is that the metallicity no, comes into the, the, H2, the but, formation of the H2. But if you're just talking about the dynamical pressure, it doesn't care whether it's H2 or H1. It's just rho intensity. That's, that's true. Yes, that's true. Right. So that doesn't care about the yeah. metallicity. And you're not mixing rho v squared of the gas with this. That's not really a pressure term. That's a weight term. Mm -hmm. I decided not to put it in there to sort of uh, not make it. I guess coming to a theory institute, not having the equation in there is not. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I can show you the experience. Yeah, okay. So we should talk about it after. Yeah. Because it, it goes back to Peter's questions about. Right? I mean, the original argument is that if you don't want things collapsing and making stars in a hurry, you need something to hold it up. Exactly. And that yeah. turns out to be 
essentially that turbulent pressure, which isn't the same thing as the dynamical weight, but if it's in hydrostatic equilibrium, they should be the same. It, it, that's the point I was going to make, because actually the Edge Khalifa work uses hydrostatic equilibrium pressure and actually finds more or less the same thing. Right. Why did you choose the term retired instead of depleted? I didn't choose it. That don't blame me, Juno. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't was, was me. Although I should say, I quite like it because it captures the idea that Some you used to be active. Some galaxies do their best work in retirement. Sorry? <laughs> Some galaxies do their best work in retirement. <laughs> That's a good way to leave it. <laughs>